If I were to describe how the average Catholic looks at the world today, I'd describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven, and everybody's going that way. And narrow is the door that leads to hell, and hardly anybody's going that way. But you know what? That's just the opposite of what Jesus himself tells us the situation is. Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are traveling that way. And narrow is the door that leads to life, and few there are who are finding it. Now, Jesus didn't say this because this is how it has to be. People who are on the Broadway don't have to stay on the Broadway, and that's where we come in. That's where our prayer, that's where our love, that's where our intercession, that's where our witness comes in. We need to really invite people to leave the path that's leading to destruction and find the person of Jesus Christ who can lead them to true life here on this earth and eternal life. Hey, welcome to this program, which is called The Choices We Face. And the reason why it's called The Choices We Face is that we are facing choices. And we are talking today about some of the most fundamental choices that anybody could ever face. The, the choice of for and against God, the choice for and against salvation. And I'm really happy that Peter and I could share with you today some of these most important things. Good to be with you, Ralph. Good to be with you too, Peter. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have a great video company right in our area who's able to uh, tape things that we do that we can share with our viewers. You know, and once a year we have a gathering for everybody who's a supporter of Renewal Ministries and uh, it's usually in May or June and, you know, everybody's welcome. But uh, this year we, we did a gathering where we talked about some of the most fundamental choices that we ever face and we're going to show you some video from that. Now, one of the tremendous emphases in the Catholic Church these days is on divine mercy, St. Faustina. Uh, God raised up a saint to particularly draw the attention in our age to the amazing mercy of God. And, and what, Saint Faust, what the Lord told St. Faustina is that the greatest sinner is most entitled to my mercy. There's no sin too great for the forgiveness of God. But the most cunning of serpents has twisted that in many people's minds. Most people have become presumptuous about God's mercy. If you scratch the surface in many of our fellow Catholics say, God is so merciful, he, he won't send people to hell. I mean, maybe Hitler, you know, but not, not, not good, nice people like we know in our town, you know. I mean, people in Ann Arbor, you know, wear deodorant and have advanced degrees. I mean, God wouldn't send people <laughs> like that to hell. And yet this town is a font of profound rebellion against God and profound parroting of the deception of the evil one. People are being corrupted here. People are having their faith taken away here. People are being led to give their loyalty to the prince of this world and the wisdom of this age without using those names. The most advanced people think. You don't really believe that, do you? It works through intimidation and peer pressure and social pressure. Who wants to appear to be a bigot or, or dumb or, or not with it, or not part of the in-group. The, the powerful pressures coming out from many of our universities that are taking people away from God and confirming them in rebellion, a rejection of God's word and a rejection of God. But that's not the whole message of divine mercy. And it's sad to see the devil taking good things. He always takes good things and twice tries to turn it to his purpose. And there's a tremendous presumption that's gone on about God's so merciful, nobody's gonna go to hell. Or maybe Hitler, like I said. But listen to what Jesus told St. Faustina. Jesus looked at me and said, souls perish in spite of my bitter passion. I am giving them the last hope of salvation, the feast of my mercy. If they will not adore my mercy, they will perish for all eternity. Secretary of my mercy, write, tell souls about this great mercy of mine because the awful day of my justice is near. 
The Lord specifically told St. Faustina, I'm sending you with a message of mercy to prepare the world for my return in glory to judge the living and the dead. So get people ready to meet me as judge. And if people don't respond to mercy, they'll perish. That's what Jesus told the apostle of divine mercy. Not only that, but during an eight-day retreat in 1936, the Lord had an angel take her on a tour of hell. And she describes what she saw. And she says the Lord told her to write it down. I've debated about whether to share this or not, but I'm going to. Today I was led by an angel to the chasms of hell. It's a place of great suffering. How awesomely large and extensive it is. The kinds of sufferings I saw, the first is that, the first that constitutes hell is the loss of God. The second is perpetual remorse of conscience. The third is that one's condition will never change. The fourth is the fire that will penetrate the soul without destroying it, a terrible suffering, since it's purely spiritual fire. The fifth suffering is continual darkness and a terrible suffocating smell. And despite the darkness, the devils and the souls of the damned see each other in all the evil, both of others and their own. The opposite of the beatific vision, the demonic vision. The sixth suffering is the constant company of Satan. Not a pleasant dinner companion because he's devouring you. The seventh suffering is horrible despair, hatred of God, vile words, curses and blasphemies. These are the sufferings suffered by all the damned together, but that's not the end of it. There are special sufferings destined for particular souls. These are the torments of the senses. Each soul undergoes terrible and indescribable sufferings related to the manner in which it has sinned. There are caverns and pits of suffering where one form of agony differs from another. I would have died at the very sight of these if the omnipotence of God had not supported me. Let the sinner know that he will suffer throughout all eternity in those senses which he made use of to sin. Nobody tells us about this part of the message. All we hear is mercy. We don't hear about the need to respond to mercy. And then she says, I am writing this at the command of God so that no soul may find an excuse by saying there is no hell or that nobody has ever been there. And lots of famous people say that. And so no one can say what it's like. I, Sister Faustina, by the order of God, have visited the abysses of hell so that I might tell souls about it and testify to its existence. I cannot speak about it now, but I have received a command from God to leave it in writing. The devils were full of hatred for me, but they had to obey me at the command of God. And what I have written is but a pale shadow of the things I saw. But I notice one thing, that most of the souls there are those who disbelieve that there is a hell. Section 741 of her diary. This is why Jesus commands us to preach repentance. This is why the message that he's asked us to preach is repentance for the sake of salvation. Acts chapter 10, verses 42 to 43. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The response to mercy is repentance and faith. Believing the truth that we've heard. Believing the truth we've seen in the cross of Christ. Believing the preaching of the gospel. Responding to the word of God with faith and trust and confidence and acting on that faith by repentance. Now, sometimes when you talk about things like this, people raise the question, how could a good God send someone to hell? And it's a good question. Catherine of Siena, 600 years or so before St. Faustina, also a saint, also a doctor, and a doctor of the church, says we actually choose our own destinies. We actually choose our own destinations. This is what she says. 
How great is the stupidity of those who make themselves weak in spite of my strengthening and put themselves into the devil's hands. I want you to know then, th this is the father speaking to us, to her, that at the moment of death, because they have put themselves during life under the devil's rule, not by force because they cannot be forced as I told you, they put themselves voluntarily into his hands. And you don't have to make a pact with Satan to put yourself voluntarily into your hands. You just have to believe his lies and act on those lies in a way that leads you into opposition of God's will. Because they come to the point of death under this perverse rule, they can expect no other judgment but that of their own conscience. They come without hope to eternal damnation. In hate, they grasp at hell in the moment of their death. And even before they possess it, they take hell as their prize along with their lords, the demons. As horrible as the final moments of unrepentant sinners are, so wonderful are the final moments of those who die trusting in the mercy of the Lord. The father says, the just, on the other hand, have lived in charity and die in love. If they have lived perfectly in virtue, enlightened by faith, seeing with faith, and trusting completely in the blood of the Lamb, when they come to the point of death, they see the good I have prepared for them. They embrace it with the arms of love, reaching out with the grasp of love to me, the supreme and eternal good at the very edge of death, and so they taste eternal life even before they have left their mortal bodies. And even purgatory makes perfect sense and is revealed as a marvelous provision of God's mercy, a wonderful part of the good news. There are others who have passed through life, the father speaking to Catherine, and arrive at the end point of death with only a commonplace love, and they were never very perfect. These embrace my mercy with the same light of faith and hope as those who were perfect. But these have this light imperfectly, and because they are imperfect, they reach out for mercy, considering my mercy greater than their own guilt. And then the Father summarizes. So no one waits to be judged. All receive their appointed place as they leave this life. They taste it and possess it even before they leave their bodies at the moment of death. The damned in hate and despair, the perfect in love with the light of faith and trusting in the blood, and the imperfect in mercy and with the same faith come to that place called purgatory. Now, the idea that God doesn't send anybody to hell but people choose it for themselves is a profound truth here and it's based on the teaching of Jesus. John chapter 12, this is what Jesus says. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has a judge. The word that I have spoken will be his judge on the last day. It's not gonna do to say, I didn't know you were serious. I didn't know you meant it. I didn't know I really had to pay attention to that. We have an obligation when we hear the word of God, to treasure it and to obey it. For I have not spoken on my own authority. The Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment about what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I, what I say, therefore, I say as the Father has bid me. It's a very serious thing to hear the word of God and shrug it off. It's a very serious thing. And that very word, Jesus says, will be our judge on the last day. On the other hand, there's a little bit more to it than that. We don't just choose our own destinies, but God has established the order of the universe in this way. So when Luke says in Acts chapter 10, he says this, we just read it, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God to be judged of the living and the dead. So God has appointed Jesus 
to be the judge of the living and the dead. And somehow you gotta put that together with the word being your judge and you choosing your own destiny. It all is kind of part of a bigger picture.